All right, so this next lecture is on the randomized block design. This is going to come from section 10.2 in the textbook. We're going to start off with the, uh, with the linear model, talk about the different parts. First, we're going to start off with fixed effects. Okay. Uh, fixed effects model. One way fixed effects. It's one way because there's only one independent variable. There's only one set of treatments. Um, the way the book has this, the only way you know that this is fixed effects is because I told you. In a lot of sources, fixed effects will have Greek letters and random effects will have Latin letters. So this would be a T if it were fixed, uh, if it were a random effect. Here's the setting. Do I have a good setting that we can use here? I don't know if we got a setting. Let's go back and do the teacher thing. Uh, student achievement. So this y sub i j student achievement don't know how that's getting measured but let's pretend that we know. And these tau, since these are fixed effects, they have to be um, levels that we care about, that we want to actually compare. So let's say that there's method A for teaching, and it's a well-known method, and method B for teaching, and another well-known method, and you want to test which of those two methods is preferred. So that would make this a fixed effect. Because I like doing things in three, let's say that there's a third method. We'll call that method C. This mu is the overall average, same as always. This epsilon is going to be our unexplained variation. Remember that's unexplained, not unexplainable. That unexplained variation is going to include things that are, that, uh, it's going to include variation that is explainable, that we're not bothering to explain, plus unexplainable variation. So it's going to be both the explainable and the unexplainable. What they have in common is we're not, be, uh, we're not bothering to measure them. So this is a very typical one-way fixed effects. Now let's say that we want to add to this. We, in, in the last lecture, we talked about teachers and how they add some variation. So instead of having the epsilon ij's, where's my eraser? It's over here. Let's break that epsilon ij up into some variation that we're going to explain, and then some additional variation. So let's break it up into teacher effect and unexplained variation. Since we're now measuring teacher effect, we have to add another variable to our linear model. So instead of this simple one-way ANOVA, we're going to have a two-way. We're going to have a two-way usually without interaction. But if we do make more than one measurement per teacher, per teaching method, Adding in an interaction allows us to measure some very important things. So this is the linear model without the teacher effect, and here it is with. Note that this epsilon ij and this epsilon ij are not the same. And note that the book uses Greek letters even though this is random variable. We, we don't care to compare Teacher Johnson with Teacher Etheridge. We're just calling them teachers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we're using the teachers to help explain some of this unexplained variation. And in doing so, we make a more powerful test. This teacher effect is called a blocking variable. It's also called a control variable. 
because it controls some of the variation that we really want to control, but we don't really care about how it affects this passive eye. The math in solving this linear equation is going to be exactly the same thing. This linear model, doing the math, it doesn't care if these are fixed or random effects. It just sees two variables and we're going to go ahead and solve that. Or we have solved it already. The interpretation differs though. The math is the same. The interpretation does differ slightly. Um, and as we got ahead in the last as we had in the last lecture, with these random effects, it's not the effects that we're trying to compare with each other that would be fixed. We're looking at the variation. And how much variation is explained by including that, in this case, the teacher effect. So we've got our set of null hypotheses that deal with the tau. We know how to do those, and we've been doing those. That was the entire first half of the course, more or less. But we've also got these null hypotheses, or this null hypothesis dealing with the betas. And the variance of the beta j equals zero, which again, the book will write as sigma squared sub beta, which is a good, good idea. So this is the type of, it, of hypothesis that you'd be looking at for a fixed effect. And this is what you'd be looking at for the random effect. And if we fail to reject the null hypothesis that the variation of beta is a zero, then we're actually concluding that that blocking is irrelevant. We may have done it. It didn't add anything to our understanding. So in this case, and from the example 6.4, I believe, um, we found out that the teacher effect well, we, did, we were unable to reject this null hypothesis for the teacher effect, meaning if there is variation caused by the teacher, it's so small that we did not detect it. If we're looking at this in terms of plants, we may be comparing different levels of fertilizer for the plants, and then the blocking variable most likely is going to be a specific plot in the ground. There's lots and lots. There's an infinite number of plots in the ground. We're just choosing a subset of those. We're not trying to compare plot one with plot five. We don't care about that. We just realize that where the plant is planted, that actually made sense, which plot that it's put into is going to affect the outcome. Therefore, it's going to increase the variation. So that's why that would be a blocking variable. And if in that case we found out that the variation of the block is not significantly different from zero, then that tells us that the plots that we pl uh, planted them in were not significantly different, didn't have much of an effect on that dependent variable. Here the F statistic was uh, call this, call it mean squared for the treatment. That was the genuine F statistic. F statistic. It worked kind of nicely. For testing the Bs, the ratio of the mean squared for the blocking divided by the mean squared error is actually not going to give us the correct F statistic. If we look at the expected mean squared between and the expected mean squared error for this model, we we'll realize that when we do the division, we're not actually going to get, we're not going to be able to just focus on one of those variances. Computers don't have to fix that though. I'm going to talk about one thing to measure, and that's the relative efficiency. I'm going to go to poof. Relative efficiency is essentially a measure of how, how well that blocking variable acted, how much you were better able to estimate the effect of the tau's on the y's with the blocking variable versus without it. 
larger numbers are better. Formula for relative efficiency is very straightforward. This is essentially the residual variation with a completely randomized design. It's the design without the blocking. And this is the residual variation with the block in included, BD for block design. Formula for the BD, S squared BD, it's just the mean squared error from running your blocking ANOVA. So you run this ANOVA, you'll get a mean squared error or a mean squared within, that's your S squared BD. Your S squared CR is going to be a linear combination of the blocking MSD and the mean squared between. the number of blocks. So in our example, if you go back, there were, I actually didn't specify how many teachers that we were pulling from. Let's say we were pulling from 20 teachers. B would be 20 in that case. MSB is the mean squared between from the ANOVA that you run on this block design. MSE is the mean squared error that you run on this block design. Uh, B times T minus one actually n minus 1, the total sample size minus 1. No, sorry. Minus b. This is the usual degrees of freedom for error, or the degrees of freedom within. And the denominator is, this is the n minus 1. So that's the total degrees of freedom. And it's just a linear combination of the two. So from this, you put those numbers into here, and if this number is greater than 1, then that means that the blocking helped. The larger the number, the more that the blocking helped. So for instance, if the relative efficiency was equal to 14.2, then blocking allowed us to use 14.2 times fewer elements. We'll go with that. The elements. So essentially, if we had a sample size of 10 with our blocking, then in order to get the same power, we would have to use 14.2 times that if we didn't include the blocking. So if n is, four, if n is 10 here, and the relative efficiency is 14.2, then this model without the blocking would require 142 for our sample size. Usually your relative efficiency will be much less than 14.2. Um, six is a good one. Um, three to six is usually what I expect in my, in my work. So if you get a relative efficiency of 14.2, you picked a really good blocking variable. 
So really, that's the end of this lecture. Um, so here's the takeaways. And there is a lot of overlap between this lecture and the previous one, simply because random effects are a little confusing to some people, especially since we've been working on fixed effects forever and we've never really thought about what a random effect could be or why we would want to add them. So again, for random effects, we do not care about the individual levels. Or their effects. It's used to control variation. Again, when I say control variation, I mean it explains some of that unexplained epsilon ij variation. Yeah, that's good enough. An example of a random effect is blocking. And if we do blocking, we do care about the relative efficiency. And that relative efficiency is essentially a measure of the unexplained variation. It's going to be the unexplained variation for the completely randomized design divided by the unexplained variation of the blocking design. The larger that ratio, the better job that our blocking did. If that ratio is 1, then that block was completely irrelevant. But then, if this ratio is 1, then we know the following. Sigma squared for the blocking is equal to 0. That is, the blocking had absolutely no effect. But the blocking variable had absolutely no effect on our dependent variable. So where do you go from here? R people go to R, SAS people go to SAS, and we'll see how to do some of these things in our computer program.